All right. Good morning, everybody. I invite you to stand with me. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, and we're going to have a time of worship before we get going with today's message. So join me. Let's bow our heads. Father, we want to give you thanks once again just for allowing us to come together and um, with open hearts to receive what it is that you have to impart to us here today. We love your word, Lord. Thank you so much that you love us enough to just... Um, Keep us always in that place where we can continue to grow and to learn and draw closer to you. And so we just pray that this time of worship would just be an acceptable sacrifice of praise that you'd be honored and glorified here in this place. We acknowledge your presence. Holy Spirit, have your way with us here this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, good morning. Good morning. Who's glad to be here? Yeah, good. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. Oh, my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, the darkest night. You are close like no other. I know you as a father, known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God all my life, and all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness, your goodness is coming after me Is running after me Your goodness is running after me running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after running after me all my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after running after me with my life laid down, surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Amen. Father, we give you thanks that uh, we can even sense that there are times in our lives where you're just running after us. Even in our attempts to distance ourselves, thank you for your faithfulness 
in our moments of unfaithfulness in our lives. We love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the father of his store and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fail. By his blood and in his deed, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. Oh, praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. One more time, praise the Father. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise forever to the King of kings. Praise forever to the King. Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. 
over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Oh, your name is power Your name is healing your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over fear and all anxiety Every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Oh, shout Jesus from the mountain Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness Over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus Oh, your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire And I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus your name is power. Oh, and your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Oh, your name is power. Your name is healing, your name is light. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like the fire. Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace in His presence I speak Jesus And Lord, we acknowledge that there is power in the name of Jesus we acknowledge that in you we can be healed and delivered from so much, Lord. And as we draw closer unto thee, Father, sensing your presence, may it just cause us to just give in and allow you to work in our lives. We are willing, Father, that you would work through each and every one of us as we surrender ourselves. We, we need more of you. And it's certainly not by our abilities or powers or strengths, but by your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. All right. So good worship. I was doing lyrics, as you could tell. I got so caught up in worship, I, I forgot to hit enter a few times there. But 
That's good. That's why I'm the, I only teach. That's my only gift. So I leave everything else to everybody. All right, a couple of announcements. If you guys have your bulletins, we see uh, a couple things coming up this week. First, our men's study Tuesday nights. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with that, uh, Miguel is the guy you want to see. He's not here this morning. He's out of town, but you can catch me. I'll tell you all the information, where it's at, all that good stuff. So uh, I encourage you guys, if you are interested in that, uh, to, to uh, really seek into that, pray about it. Wednesday night, prayer in the Word. We're going to be meeting at John and Gina's house. Oh, right here. They're just around the corner. So that'll be this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. You could also join us on Zoom. Uh, but I'd encourage you to come. We're going through the book of 1 Samuel. So we'll be, uh, I think, picking up in chapter 6 this week. Um, and then also this Friday is our married couple study and fellowship. So that's going to be at our house, me and Diana. Uh, so that'll be this Friday the 21st. We'll be meeting at 630. Bring a finger food to share and we'll get into the word and prayer together as married couples. And lastly, this coming uh, Saturday is going to be our ladies hike in Devo. So it's kind of going to be a long morning for those that want to participate in everything. Uh, you're going to be meeting over at Hillcrest Park in Fullerton, and then for an hour walking or hiking from 9.30 to 11, breakfast in Devo, and then at 11, we're having Margo. She comes to church here. She, she's a certified trainer, so she's going to meet with the ladies and just give them health tips, uh, ways to stretch, exercise, strength, conditioning, so uh, to whatever level you're at, she can kind of give you some direction. So you don't have to go to the whole thing if you just want to pick a part of that. Um, I think I'll just take the, the breakfast part and then take off. But, um, uh, so, but no, if you want to just come for the walk or breakfast, Devo, um, or the whole thing, you're welcome to come to any part or the whole thing, you ladies. Um, and so with that, we're going to pray, dismiss the youth, pray for the tithes and offerings. Also, we're in between books. We just finished Ephesians. As I told you, starting next week, we're going to get into the seven letters to the seven churches. And so um, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. And so it's really good because there's a lot of applications in each of those churches. Um, there's a local church. There's a word to all churches throughout history. Christ wrote a letter to each of these seven literal churches related to issues that they were going through, struggles, persecutions, um, going off track in their walk with the Lord. And so God preserved each of those letters throughout the church history for us to read and grow as a church as well, local church here, thousands of miles away on the other side of the world. But also there's a specific individual application. They're, they're great letters to go through to evaluate where we're at with the Lord. Have we forgotten our first love? What does that mean to forget your first love? Smyrna, the persecuted church. Why do we go through trials and difficulty? So each of the letters has a personal application that we as believers could take, examine our walk, be encouraged or challenged and grow in. So I'd encourage you guys to join us again starting next week. But uh, in between, I asked Pastor Neil to come, and he's actually going to share after we do worship and give us a word from the Gospel of John. So let's go ahead and pray and uh, continue with our service. So Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to get together. And Lord, the things that you provide. Lord, we are here, Lord, I pray, not just out of obligation, not because it's something to do on Sundays or something we ought to do, but I pray we're here to meet with the God of the universe. You're the almighty creator. You're holy and righteous, but Lord, you're merciful, gracious, and loving. And Lord, you have provided a way for us to come into your presence and call you Father. So thank you for Jesus. And Lord, you are here to reveal yourself. You want to meet every single person in this room this morning, and you know exactly where they're at. Some here need encouragement, some need correction, some need edification, some need strength. Whatever it is that each of us need, I pray, Lord, we know that you are here to meet that need, to answer that question. There's things we don't even know we need, and you're here to minister to us in those areas. Let us come now expectantly. Let us worship you accordingly. I just pray you prepare our hearts, Lord, these last few songs that we would elevate you and worship you, that we would receive and obey your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you also. I just pray for the time of tithes and offerings. You don't need our money, Lord, but you give us an opportunity to give. All of our money belongs to you. And so, Lord, we give back a portion. We pray that whatever is given, that we give joyfully. We give with the intent that your name would be glorified. And Lord, we pray that expectation would be fulfilled. Whoever has charge of this money, we pray that it would be used, Lord, for the Great Commission, 
for sharing the gospel, for discipling those who do believe, for reaching the community that you placed us in. Give us a heart, Lord, for in reach to bless one another, but also outreach to reach the community and those that don't have a relationship with you. We lift these things before you now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, youth, you guys can be dismissed, and then we're going to continue on with a couple more songs. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
stand for our last song. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for just acknowledging that wonderful promise, knowing that we are chosen by you and that we are children. And Father, we're blessed and um, that we can just have that security and hold on to, to that truth, Lord. We long to just draw closer into thee. And I pray that this morning, that uh, upon conclusion of our service, we could leave this place different, closer to you than 
before we entered in this place. And we just trust you, Lord, acknowledging your presence. Go before us. Speak to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning, this July 16th, this hot July 16th. Well, it's nice to be in here. We have some air conditioning. I don't know how many years we've been here, but they finally seemed like they got all the inside temperatures worked out. So that's a good thing. So this morning, as uh, Pastor Jason mentioned, we're going to be in the Gospel of John this morning. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. And as you're doing that, I want to thank all of you for praying for me. I had back surgery. It will be six weeks tomorrow when I had the back surgery, and it was a success. I'm still recovering, but uh, the pain that I had been experiencing for decades is gone. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. I was looking as well. The last time that I taught, the last time I was able to teach was here a little over a year ago. And I remember having to sit on this stool. I brought it. It's still my crutch in case I need it this morning. Uh, But a lot of things have changed since then, at least physically for me. And I'm just really praising God for that. So I appreciate your prayers. So we're going to be in John chapter 15 this morning. This part of uh, the Bible and what we'll be looking at uh, today is part of what is called the Upper Room Discourse. So I'm going to set the scene for you of what's going on here, here in John chapter 15. Traditionally, this is the night of Christ's betrayal. This has been thought to be a Thursday night, betrayed by Judas in the garden early on Friday morning. He is, Jesus is tried, convicted, and crucified before the Sabbath begins on sunset uh, Friday evening. However, over in John chapter 19, I'll just read this verse to you. John chapter 19, verse 31 says, The Jews, therefore, because the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. And then it says, For that Sabbath day was a high day. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So what is a high day, a high holy day? There's evidence that this is a double Sabbath. Back-to-back Sabbath days. The Passover Sabbath was then uh, followed the next day by the Friday weekly Sabbath. So if Jesus was crucified on, uh, before sunset on Friday, to me it's hard to determine or count out three days and three nights in the center of the earth. How does that work if he was uh, crucified before sunset on Friday and he rose from the the grave uh, on dawn on Sunday? So this could be an answer to that. If the Passover meal which, we, which we're uh, uh, going to read about, and, and this is all about that, happens on Wednesday night. He was betrayed early Thursday morning, tried, convicted, and crucified before sunset on Thursday. Then you can have three days and three nights that Jesus is in, uh, in the tomb. It's just something you consider. Where I got this information, and if you're interested in that, you can go online to Chuck Smith's Sermon Notes, For John 19.31, if you're interested in that and read up on that on yourself, it gives us another perspective to this. However, whether it's a Wednesday night or a Thursday night, they've experienced the Passover meal. John chapter 13 says that he knows his hour has come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Yet knowing that, Jesus still celebrates this Passover uh, with his disciples. In fact, uh, the Passover meal will not, will not only be his last Passover, this is the last meal that he'll ever take before the cross. But he celebrates. Then he washes the disciples' feet. Judas has taken the morsel of bread from Jesus and he's left. Jesus knows he will die the next day. In chapter 14, they're still in the upper room. Jesus begins talking about heaven, that he's going to go away and prepare a place for them. He's going to go away and he's preparing a place for you and preparing a place for me as well. And he does that, that we would all have this hope of heaven. There in chapter 14, Philip then says, show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. And in a claim of equality with the Father, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
He follows that by giving them the promise of the comforter there in chapter 14, the Holy Spirit to come. Finally, he ends chapter 14, and we're in chapter 15, verse 1. The last verse of 14 says, he says, arise, let's go from here. And so chapter 15 begins as they're leaving the upper room. They're making their way through the city across the temple area to uh, across a small, the small Kadron Valley and to arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane for an evening of prayer. It was a little over a mile walk from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke 22 tells us this was normal for Jesus to retire there for prayer in the garden. So while on their way, they're making their way through the city, they're walking uh, through the streets of the city, Jesus continues the conversation with his disciples. Chapters 15, 16, and 17, in fact, all happen while they're walking from the upper room to the garden. Now, in Jerusalem at this time, it's Passover. The city is swelled to over 2 million people. The temple is open 24-7. It's open all week, all the time. Jesus might have seen the gates of the temple, and he'll use those gates as a visual aid in teaching his disciples and teaching you and I as well. Now, in Jesus' days, vineyards were very common. You remember when the spies were sent out to view the land, what did they come back with? They came back with these huge clusters of grapes. Early Jewish coins had a vineyard stamped on them. Most important of all, Israel was considered to be known as God's vineyard. So the temple in Jerusalem at this time, rebuilt by Herod, the gates had this ornamental ironwork in the form of golden grape clusters. Passover happened at a full moon. Now you can imagine walking through the city, the full moon shining on these golden gates. It would have been a very dramatic scene uh, for the works of the temple. And so with that, all as a background, we go here to chapter 15, verse 1, as they're making their way through the city, I believe probably just passing by the temple, and Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, or the husbandman. He speaks to his disciples now through this imagery of a vine and a vine dresser, or a husbandman. He begins this section, the first two words, another I am statement. Now, I am is a name describing God. Jesus uses that several times in the New Testament to uh, describe himself. And it's a reference to Exodus chapter 3. You know the story of Moses being confronted with the burning bush. The voice coming telling him that you're going to be the deliverer from the children of Israel out of Egypt. And after all of his objections, finally Moses says, well, who shall I tell sent me? And God says, tell them I am has sent you. I am is defined as the unchanging, self-existent, eternal God. In John chapter 8, Jesus says this to the uh, Pharisees in John chapter 8, verses 23 and 24. He said, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of the world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am. You shall die in your sins. So here he says, I am the true vine. If you don't believe that I am, Jesus says you'll die in your sins. You must understand and believe that I am God, God in the flesh. This final I am statement that he makes, he's declaring that I am the true vine. And the true vine then is in contrast to, as we mentioned earlier, the vine that had not been true, and that was Israel. Israel was God's vineyard, yet they had not been a true vine unto God. In Isaiah chapter 5, I'll read this to you, Isaiah 5 Verses 1 and 2. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he dug it and gathered out the stones and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press in it. And he looked for it to bring forth good grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Israel never succeeded in what Jesus or what the Father had for them. God's purpose for Israel was that they would be a fruitful vine and bear fruit for him. As well in Psalms, the 80th Psalm, verses 8 and 9, listen to this. Psalm 80, verse 8 and 9. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, and you have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and did cause it to take deep root and fill the land. That was God's plan for Israel. 
I'm giving you this promised land overflowing with milk and honey for you to be planted there and be a vineyard that would bring forth good fruit. But they had failed to be God's true vineyard. So here and now, today, it's all about the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the one you're to stay plugged into. Also in this, in this short verse 1, he talks about his father being uh, the husbandman, the vine dresser. The Greek word for husbandman is Georgos. From this word, we get the name George, actually. It means tiller of the soil. So the husbandman, the vine dresser, is the one who cultivates, watches over, and reaps the fruit. The husbandman is to a vineyard what a gardener is to a garden. What does a gardener do? He works among the plants. He wants to make them as fruitful as possible. And God has directed Israel, you stay connected to me, that you'll be a fruitful, blessed people as you obey me. But they failed to do that. The husband rejected Israel as a vine. Jesus is now the true vine. The true branches will be those that are in the true vine. <coughs> Excuse me. And to show just how far Israel had, had uh, gone away from being the true vine, they were plotting and planning how they could kill Jesus the next day. Well, let's read on now. Verse 2. John 15, Jesus teaching his disciples, teaching us, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges or prunes it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now we see the focus is on the father, Jesus says, the husbandman, the vineyard, uh, uh, the one who cultivates the vineyard. The father is interested in harvesting more fruit. But as we read this verse, to me, that's a terrifying verse, isn't it? I'm either going to be cut off or cut on, according to as we read verse 2. So it's important for us to understand some Greek meanings of a couple of words in this verse. And the first word, the first uh, phrase I want to direct your attention to is in the middle where he says, if you bear not fruit, he takes away. Okay, that word take away in the Greek is A-I-R-O, arrow. It has three meanings. The strongest meaning is to raise or to lift up. It's the same word used in John eleven forty one, where Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven at the tomb of Lazarus. The second meaning is to carry what has been raised up. The third meaning is to carry off or remove. The next word to understand is the word purge or prune at the end of the verse there. If you bear fruit, he's going to prune you. Not the correct definition. That gives the idea that God has a pair of hedge clippers and he's going after you. Even if you're bearing fruit, he's going to cut on you. The Greek word here for purge or for prune is kathario, and it means to cleanse. Look at verse 3. Now you are clean. Same word. Now you are clean to the words that I spoke to you. It's the same Greek word. So if you put these thoughts together, I believe what Jesus is saying is every branch that bears not fruit, my father lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he cleanses. Okay? Now, in those days, a branch of the vine was not supported on a trellis like we see today. A lot of the things we plant today are supported by a, a trellis. Uh, tomatoes, grapes, again, for vineyards, things like that. They're supported. But in those days, they weren't. The vines would be laid on a row of rocks. And under its weight, the branches could sag down in the dirt. The rain would come. Those fruit-bearing branches would be laying in the mud. And so the husband would come along, the, the, the uh, vine dresser, lift up those branches, brace them up, and if there was any dirt on them, he would wash the dirt off. Now, <clears throat> I believe that that would be the correct uh, uh, interpretation of verse 2. He would love lovingly, tenderly, caringly, carefully tend to the vineyard, not take some branches away, not get rid of those. In fact, Jesus said earlier in John chapter 6, verse 37, he says, All the Father gives me shall come unto me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. And yet we read in, the, in this verse, it says, He will take those away. Notice as well that this branch, Jesus says, in me, every branch in me, In me. These are people that are believing in Christ. You're in Christ. Are you going to be taken away because there's no fruit being born in your life? I don't believe so. It's as if when you are down, God lifts you up. 
And at times our lives are like sagging branches, aren't they? Life weighs us down. The last thing we seem to be able to do is to bear fruit. So Jesus, I believe, is telling us it's okay if you're a sagging branch right now. Because the Father loves to tend to you. He wants to lift you up, not manhandle you, belittle you, or cut you off, but tenderly, carefully lift you up, get you in a place where you can bear fruit once again. <clears throat> Excuse me. I believe it's the Father himself who enables the nutrients to flow into our lives once again. He himself restores us to a place where we once again can bear fruit. Again, in support of that, of that thought, in uh, Psalm 145, Verse 14, listen to uh, what David says. The Lord upholds all that fall and raises up all those who are bowed down. That seems to be consistent with what I believe this verse is telling us, that the Father wants to lift us up, not cut us off, not get us uh, uh, away from the vine, but lift us up and get us to a place where we can bear fruit once again. And if there's any dirt on us because we're bearing fruit, he doesn't prune us, cut us, but he cleanses us. He washes us off, according to the next verse, which we'll see in a moment. A lot of people have, mistake, have this mistaken concept that God is waiting for weakness. Anything that will allow him to come down hard and judge us and cut us off. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe God's desire is to see us succeed as believers. And I believe he'll help us to do that. Let's look at verse 3 now. Jesus says to the disciples, to you and I as well. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He doesn't say, now you are bloody by the clippers I'm going to uh, uh, use on you. He's saying, no, I'm going to lift up the branch that's beaten down and wash off the fruit that may have dirt on it through the word. The word of God, so important. The cleansing effect of the word. We see it in Ephesians chapter 5. The washing of the water by the word. The word will wash us and cleanse us. It's the cleansing agent in our lives. The word guides us in the ways of God, helping us that we might bear more fruit. And then we are cleansed by it. How do we bear more fruit for God? Not by him cutting on us, not by him bloodying us, but by you and I being in the word. That's how our lives are cleaned up. That's how more fruit will come, by a commitment to the word, by staying in the word. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. In Psalm 119, verse 9, David said the same thing. How shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to thy word. Cleansed and washed that you may bring forth more fruit in your life. Let's go on now to verse 4. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. This word abide... We see it three times in this verse. Actually, it'll be eight times before we get to verse 10. The word abide. It's a key to the Christian experience, abiding in Jesus. Jesus, again, is referring to the vine and the branches. A branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. We can't bear fruit unless we abide in the vine, the true vine being Jesus. It would be silly for us to say, oh, look at that, that avocado tree. Look at that branch and all the fruit that's coming off that branch. I'm going to cut that off and take it home, and I'll have it for myself. Well, that branch out of the vine, out of the, uh, of the trunk of the tree, it's dead. It's not going to bear fruit. Same with our lives. We must abide in Jesus. Fruit that God desires is something we cannot uh, produce ourselves. We see that in, our verse, in this verse. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. We can't do that on our own. But that same branch does not strain or strive to produce fruit. It's a natural product of that branch abiding in the vine. Fruit will come from our lives as we abide in the vine in Jesus. Again, key to fruitfulness is abiding. Let's look at the definition of that Greek word. The Greek word for abiding is men. Uh, Dash O, meno, means to continue, to remain, to make him your home, and to stay and not depart. That's what abiding is. When Paul was in Greece, and he was talking to those on Mars Hill, speaking of Jesus in Acts 17, 28, Paul said this, For in him we live, we move, we have our being. <coughs> Excuse me. 
To me, that's, that's another definition for abiding, isn't it? For in him we live, we move, we have our being. We're plugged in to Jesus. Fruitfulness comes from being plugged in, from abiding in him. In fact, fruit cannot be born outside of that relationship. The amount of fruit we can produce in our lives is predicated on the health of that relationship between us and Christ. Are we plugged in? Are we there consistently, not moving, not moving away? You can't force it. You can't struggle to produce it. As we ab abide in Christ, fruit develops naturally. So the obvious question here in verse 4 is, how is the health of your relationship with Jesus? Are you abiding? Is that a consistent being plugged into him? That's the way to become fruitful. Abide, to settle down, make myself, make yourself at home in our relationship with Jesus. And not an on again, off again, Sunday only abiding, but a lasting once and for all connection to the vine. And notice as well, it's interesting to me in verse 4, abide in me, and he says, I in you. He abides in us, we abide in him. He continues, remains, makes his home. He stays and doesn't depart from you. And so we should have that same relationship with him, to stay at home and not to depart from him, to continue to remain. So what is the fruit that, uh, that God is looking for in our lives, that Jesus is looking for? I believe the beginning of this, or the, uh, the, uh, certainly a very important fruit, is the fruit of love, isn't it? As a fruit of the Spirit is love, and we'll see that uh, in, in more in a minute. But loving God and loving his people. Let's move on now to verses 5 and 6. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So if we didn't know before verse 5, he makes it clear we're the branches. He's the vine. He specifically says that right now. And we are to uh, 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 abide in him. The true people of God are not defined by uh, a culture, cultural line or even a denominational line. The true people of God are identified by their attachment to the vine. And this describes the kind of relationship that he has, wants to have with each one of us. Abide in him because he is going to and will abide in us. Jesus, the source of life for the branches, for you and I. And that vine will supply the nutrients to the branches for the branches to bear fruit. Fruit bearing is impossible without abiding and inevitable when you abide. In verse 2, we had no fruit. Then we had fruit. And in the verse 2, more fruit. And here we have much fruit. And it's interesting to know that in each one of these terms, fruit, it's a noun. It is not an action word. It is a person, place, or thing. It's what you are. It's who you are. It's part of how you are uh, as you abide. This is part of who you are. I bear fruit. It's who I am. Person, place, or thing. A noun. That's what the, uh, that's what the grammar tells us here. It will change in a moment, but right now, it's a noun. And we see an obvious progression from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. So I would say God wants us to be fruity people, right? To bear fruit for him. Over in Colossians, there's a very interesting two verses. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I'd like to read them to you. Paul is uh, writing this letter to the church in Colossae, and he's saying in verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with all knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Notice verse 10 now, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This word fruitful is a verb. This is an action word. So I want you to be fruitful in what you do, not just who you are, but beyond that, to what you do. And so he says, as you abide, and notice in what we read here in Colossians, as you increase in the knowledge of Christ, which comes from what? Somebody tell me. We increase in the knowledge of Christ by doing what? In the word, right? In the word. We increase in the knowledge of God that we might know his will and be fruitful unto all good works. Very, uh, they go together so much. The word of God, increasing in knowledge, being fruitful, that action word into all good works. Jesus says, back to our text in verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And you can say, well, wait a minute. We built the Golden Gate Bridge without you. We put roads across America without you. We put a man on the moon without you. What he is referring to, of course, here is God's not interested in the works of the flesh, but he's referring to without him you can do nothing of a spiritual, lasting nature. Nothing, uh, you can do nothing of eternal, spiritual value that will please God without Christ, without being plugged into him. And this is an important truth that we read in verse 5. Without him, you can do nothing. We need to learn that before we go to Philippians where it says, through him I can do all things. I've got to I first realize without, I make, without him I can do nothing, but with him I can do all things. Then we'll bear fruit and then more fruit and then much fruit for him, all from just abiding in Christ. Now, verse 6 might be a, a difficult verse, but I think in what we've learned from verse 2 makes sense here in verse 6. Once again, if a man abides not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Does verse 6 describe the Christian that's in sin, that's, ba in, that's backslidden, that's not in fellowship with the Lord? Does this say that he's gathered and cast into the fires of hell? What about the prodigal son? Was he bearing fruit when he took his in inheritance and ran off? Mm -mm. It says he's just the opposite. He got into all the debauchery that the flesh could, could offer until he ran out of resources. And when he came back, did his father scold him? Did his father not allow him to come back home? Just the opposite. He ran to him and embraced him because he came back. So I don't believe that verse 6 describes a Christian that's in sin, backslidden and not in fellowship. I believe it could be a reference to somebody like Judas. Did Judas abide in Christ? I don't believe so. Was he a branch in Christ? Or was he, what we read here in verse 6, a man not abiding in Christ? Someone who professed but never possessed. The verse says this man was not in Christ, had an attachment to the cause, but was not in Christ. So what's the answer? I believe rather than we could get into a, a, a debate about it, but the, the real answer is don't live in the gray area. Just abide. Bear fruit for the Lord. That's where you're secure. Then you don't have to worry about the issues of how far can I go before I've actually lost connection, right? So let's just abide in Christ. Moving on now to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Here's a condition now for answered prayer. Are you abiding in the Lord? Are you at home in him? Are his words at home in you? A lot of times when we pray and don't receive an answer, that's where the problem lies. I'm not abiding like I should, or certainly his word is not abiding in me. James chapter 4, verse 3 says, when you pray and you don't receive, it's because you want to consume that upon your lust. You're not praying according to the will of God. When we are in the word of God, when we're abiding in him, rarely will we ever ask in prayer and be asking amiss. Because if I'm abiding in him, his word's abiding in me, I'll know how to pray and what to ask for. His will becomes my will. His will will become your will as you're in the word of God. You remember uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2? Uh, don't, be, uh, don't be transformed to this world. Let me read it before I... I've lost it in my memory. It's an old age thing here. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've already established that's by being in the word of God, that you may prove or know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So if his word is abiding in me, his will would become my will. His will will become your will. As you pray, you'll be praying in agreement and harmony with his will and purpose for your life. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. But that's not the desires of the flesh, what your flesh wants. Because if you're delighting yourself in the Lord, he will put and plant his will for you and for other situations in your life, in your heart. And he'll give you what you want when you ask for it because you'll be praying according to his will. That's what verse 7 is telling us here. Words, his words abiding in us, changing us, conforming us, knowing his will we pray successfully in. 
verses 8 through 10. In this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so, you shall, so shall you be my disciples. And the Father, and as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So again, the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit for him. <clears throat> This reinforces what we learned earlier. God's not looking for mistakes in order to judge or remove us. No. Just the opposite. He's all about helping us. Remember, lifting us up and creating an environment where we can bear much fruit. Another Old Testament verse I want to read to you, Isaiah 27, verses 2 and 3. This is about the way God tends his true vineyard, his uh, which we will be which we are part of in that day sing unto her a vineyard of red wine i the lord do keep it i will water it every moment lest any hurt it unless any hurt it i will keep keep it night and day this again a picture of the father lifting up that vine and tending to it when my life bears fruit it brings glory to god well how can i measure that when my life bears fruit I believe we look at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses uh, 22 and 23. And we read there about the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, against there is such is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and love is, a, is defined by the rest of those traits. Only when you have agape in your life can you experience any of the rest. So this describes Jesus himself. If love is evident in my life, then there's a Christ-likeness, isn't there? We're becoming more like Jesus. Love as a fruit is a natural consequence of abiding in Christ. And the love that he has for us, as he talks here about uh, the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, continue in my love. So the love that he has for us is the same love the Father has for Jesus. And that, of course, is an indescribable love. It's been there for all eternity. Yet Jesus loves us to the same depth. Notice in verse 9, again, this love relationship, as he's talking about, is a vertical relationship so far. It's about our love with Christ, Christ's love with us, our love for the Father, the Father's love for us. Before anything else, this love between Christ and me, Christ and you, has to be established, a vertical love. In verse 10, he shows us one more important way to abide. He says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Obeying his word. Jesus applies this principle to his own life at, their, up, at the end of verse 10, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Obedience. His example is, our, is how we should live, in obedience to the Father. In chapter 15, excuse me, the last verse of chapter 14, he says this. He expresses his love for the Father by doing, obeying what the Father had commanded him to do. At the end of verse 31, he says, As the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go from here. I'm obeying the Father. We need to obey Christ. Jesus says, dwell in my love. He doesn't say dwell in condemnation. Dwell in good works. Dwell in trying to do better. No, dwell in my love. Abiding in Christ, abiding in his love produces fruit. Self-condemnation doesn't produce fruit. Trying harder doesn't produce fruit. Continuing in his love does it. How are we to do that? Soak up his love. If you, as a branch, are plugged into the vine, soak up those nutrients, the love that he wants to give to you. This full expression of love will be poured out in our lives as we abide in him. Imagine a parent having a huge amount of resources they want to bless their children with, but they can't because that child is disobedient. Sonship isn't in question here. It's obedience is, 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 is the topic here. As you obey, you're going to receive more blessings from that father who has this abundance of resources. One of the coolest things that a child can do is 
be disobedient and hinder that loving parent from blessing him as he would like. So it is with our Heavenly Father. Obedience allows him to lavish us with blessings, with his love. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Jesus is saying, my joy I want to give to you. Well, I say, wait a minute. This is the night before the cross. He's about to be spit on, beaten, mocked, and insulted. By noon the next day, you won't even be able to recognize him as a man. Within 24 hours, he will be crucified. He knows all this is coming, yet he says, I want my joy to remain in you, that your joy may be full. A joy that he experiences by being in the center of the Father's will, no matter what's going to come his way. That's the joy that he wants to impart to us. Now, the disciples have been trying to deal with their grief because he says, I'm leaving you. He wants their grief turned to joy. As they come to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit, who will be left for them as he leaves... One of the fruits of the Spirit will be love. Joy is the next thing we read there. Now, we need to understand there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness depends on external circumstances. In April 15th, if you do your taxes, you're going to get a tax refund. That brings you a lot of happiness, doesn't it? But April 15th, if you get a tax bill, that'll make you very unhappy. But Jesus says, I want joy to, your joy to rise above the circumstance. The world strives for happiness. Jesus promises joy. And a joy that is not affected by circumstance. Does that mean we won't feel discouraged at times? No, we will. But under, underneath that will be an underlying joy that's there abiding. His joy, Christ's joy, comes from the redemption of man. It gives him a lot of joy to be able to say, your sins are forgiven. To receive each of, each of us into the kingdom of God brings him joy. For that joy, Hebrews 12 says that he endured the cross. His joy comes from the redemption of man. Our joy comes from being the redeemed, doesn't it? We have joy in that. That means no matter what, I'm going to heaven. No matter the earthly circumstance, I have an inheritance reserved for me in heaven. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 says this. Isaiah 61 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. He's done all that for us. He's given me salvation. He's given you salvation. And in that, I want to be extremely joyful. David said, uh, in your presence is fullness of joy. So we'll experience a fullness of that joy without ever being uh, cast down when we're in his presence. Now, up to now, we've talked about this vertical love relationship between God and each one of us. Let's read verses 12 through 15. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Now the love relationship is horizontal. My commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. And how has he loved us? He's saying it to us right there by laying down his life for his friends. So friendship, something we need to talk about because Jesus has introduced a new concept in, in this relationship, and it's friendship. We all have people that we consider friends. Some friends we hold closer than others. I, I believe that no man is an island. It seems that God has created a need within each one of us to have friends. Now Solomon said this in Proverbs 18.24. Proverbs 18.24. A man who has friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Henry Ford said, my best friend is the one who brings out the best in me. Helen Keller, the blind lady, who was an activist as well, said this, walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light. There's a Swedish proverb that says, friendship doubles our joy, divides our grief. Now that's a friend who's always there for you. 
So here Jesus is introducing a new, con a new part of this relationship between himself and his disciples. Verse 13, he defines love by saying, greater love has no man than a man lays down his life for his friends. Now he says, you are my friends, verse 14. Well, how does Jesus expre express friendship to us? I have just four quick points here. Number one is with sacrificial friendship. We see that in verse 13, where he says, greater love has no man than he would lay down his life for his friends. Others have died for someone else. Usually it's a spontaneous act of courage. When there's great danger around, you hear of heroic acts like that uh, in, during battles in war. Yet in contrast, Jesus planned to give his life for you and I before the foundations of the world were ever laid. So sacrificial friendship, number one. Number two, by taking the initiative in our relationship. <coughs> we're not going to get to it, but verse 16 says, I haven't, you haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you. So he takes the initiative by choosing us to be his friends. He expresses his friendship to us as well by challenging us to go and bear fruit. Again, in verse 16, it says that. To go and bear fruit that your fruit would remain. That fruit is, again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And being fruitful in every good work he has planned for us to do. Fourth, expresses his friendship by revealing truth to his friends. The end of verse 15 there. I have heard, I'm going to tell you all things I've heard of my father. So he reveals that, that truth to his friends. After his ascension, he gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. What is the qualifier for being his friend? Verse 14. You're my friends if you do what I've commanded you to do. Obedience brings us into this this. Uh, uh, relationship of friendship. Too many people, I believe, are, think very lightly of this relationship. There's no respect or reverence for him. Oh, you know, he's my buddy, and there's no obedience to his commandments, what he's asked us to do. Jesus says proof of friendship is obedience. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, he says in John 14, 15. Closer fr close friends agree in heart. Just like David and Jonathan, their hearts were knit together for Samuel 18:1. So Jesus is saying we have a new, deep relationship. Same mind, same goals, and so obedience is expected. Now, a master would never tell a servant things of his father, not to a mere servant. A servant was a servant. He really wouldn't know what the, what the master was thinking and the plans that he had. But a master would tell these things to his close friends, what the father uh, has for him. And he, Jesus says, I want you to know what I'm going to do. You're no longer servants. Beginning now, you're fr my friend. And so in this friendship, I'm going to let you know what the future holds and what my father has told me. There's one man who lived in the Old Testament, but is described in the New Testament, New Testament as a friend of God. Anybody know who that is? Who's a friend of God in the Old Testament? Let me say it. Abraham. Abraham described as a friend of God. In Genesis chapter 18, it's interesting what, what the Father says here. In Genesis 18, verses 17 through 19. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. And there is a, I interject there the New Testament scripture where he's a friend of God. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do righteous and, righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken to him. He's a friend because he's obeying me, and I'm going to let him know my plans. And so to reveal that plan to Abraham because he was a friend of God, he'll reveal his plans to us because we are, Christ has described us as his friends. So he says here in John 15, I call you friends for all things that I've heard of my father I have made known unto you. We're going to wrap this up with, with uh, descriptions again of the kind of friend Jesus is to each one of us. Here I have 14 points. Just listen to them. Uh, they're just one, one sentence points that I have for you. Point number one, the kind of friend Jesus is. He accepts us as we are, but doesn't leave us that way. Point number two, he has time for us and is never too busy. That's the kind of friend he is. Point number three, 
Point number three, my friend, Jesus, talks to me through his word, talks to you through his word. My friend listens to us when we pray. My friend forgives us and gives us his righteousness. Jesus, my friend, your friend, understands us in our struggles and weaknesses. My friend walks through, walks through trials with me, walks through trials with you. Jesus, my friend, your friend, is sensitive and knows us better than we know ourselves. My friend is patient with me, guides me, guides you through our personal growth with him. Point number 10, Jesus is always truthful, always faithful. He keeps his promises. 11, he confronts us when we sin because he loves us. My friend, Jesus loves me, loves you unconditionally. Point 13, my friend is preparing a place for us in heaven. Point 14, our friend is going to spend eternity with us. Jesus is calling us his friends, not because he has to, because he wants to, because he enjoys you. You know what? He likes you. Knowing you, knowing yourself, that may be a hard thing to consider, a hard thing to accept, but he likes you. Calling us friends brings, I believe, enjoyment to his ear, a smile on his face. You are my friends, and I'm proving it by what I'm about to do on the cross. So with that, it's a whole uh, bunch to take in this morning. Uh, I want to go over, again, takeaways from our study. Now these you might want to write down, five takeaways. Takeaway number one, the husbandman, the father, will lift you up when life weighs you down and wash you off through the word. He's not waiting to judge you, but he desires you to succeed as his children. Point number two, abiding is the key. You need to settle down, make yourself at home in him, then you'll bear fruit. And he has settled down and made his home in you. Abiding is the key to answered prayer. That's point number three. His word abides in me, changes my heart, when I pray, I pray according to his will. Takeaway number four. Abiding and obedience produce love that we would love one another as he has loved us. And finally, point number five. This is a new relationship he's brought us into. Christ calls us friends with sacrificial friendship and sacrificial love. He chose us and challenges us to bear fruit, and he challenges us to obey his commandments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for John 15 and this first portion of that chapter. So much there for us to, to digest, Lord. But we want to leave here, again, knowing for sure that we're plugged into you, that we're going to abide in Christ. We cannot bear fruit without abiding in the vine. We cannot accept, receive your love lest we abide in you. And you've challenged us with the, the, uh, uh, the commandment is to obey you and we then are called your friends. So Lord, let us go forth from this place this day with a resolve to obey you, to abide in you, that we would be called friends, that we would bear much fruit for the Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand for a closing song this morning? And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord Oh, all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you you lord and oh and all the earth will your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath 
in high lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in high lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, holy. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.